Well, this is the next lecture in the introduction to environmental science. It's a nice picture of uh, the Indian Ocean, actually from Diego Garcia, which is in the middle of the Indian Ocean. We'll be talking this lecture about principles of ecology, still, aquatic life zones. So that's a really pretty picture. Never been there, but I know people who have. Kraken, you know, that mythical beast of the ocean, is real. Take a look at this. Wow. That is an actual real color image of uh, a very large squid. Arctheus speciosa. Every time I pronounce my Latin, it is absolutely perfect. <laughs> yeah, you don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe it either. All right. Previously, it was only known from dead specimens. Uh, 43 feet long, 600 pound cephalopod. It means it moves itself by its head, but that's what squids do. The eyes, about right in there, are the size of dinner plates. They are huge. This photograph was taken in its natural environment, 2,000 meters deep, using visible light, light we can see, of course. We didn't know it was this color. It's kind of a silvery gray color sort of thing. We also did not know that it was a visual predator. It's very dark down here to our eyes. We can't see anything down here. Most organisms can't, but uh, this fellow can. So, what's the outline for this particular lecture? I'm going to talk about the hydrologic cycle. Lots about water, of course. Oceans, they are very vast. Shallow marine waters, very, very important in terms of biodiversity on the planet. Uh, approximately 0.2% of the uh, ocean floor uh, harbors 500,000 species. Pretty good number. Marine shores, we we'll talk a lot about them. Estuaries, salt marshes, and mangrove forests are all part of these marine shores. Watersheds, and the definition of watersheds. Rivers and streams, which are all very important to us. The watershed defines how those rivers and streams behave. And finally, lakes. And as I like to tell my classes, I could teach for years on lakes, but we won't do that. We'll just have a few minutes of it this evening. So the structure of natural systems, let's look at aquatic ecosystems. First of all, back to this kind of review from the previous lecture, the biosphere ecosphere, that life-supporting portion of the Earth. It is a closed system. We're not getting anything from outside. Asteroids aren't dropping a lot of nutrients on us, comets, that sort of thing. Pretty much everything has to be recycled and reused, all those materials. We do break these cycles, and at great risk. It's also a repeated statement from when we talk about terrestrial systems. Aquatic life zones are similar to those terrestrial biomes, but not exactly the same. Terrestrial biomes were much more dependent upon latitude, where you were north or south of the equator. However, aquatic life zones are primarily defined by sunlight penetration, that's how deep you are in the water, and the nutrients available in the water. For marine saltwater systems, coral reefs, Estuaries, coastal wetlands are critically important. The deep ocean areas may not seem so important, but they're fascinating. We learn a lot from them. And those continental shelves, those have very distinct aquatic life zones. The hydrologic cycle, spinning disk, the Earth, yeah, or part of the globe. Over 71%, 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. The oceans contain 97% of all of the water on the Earth. Polar ice caps, glaciers, 2%. Seems like a small amount, but guess what? Most of the water that we use, fresh water, and lakes, streams, and groundwater make up less than 1%. Wow. That's where we get our water from. Very small amount. So let's look more closely at the hydrologic cycle. The distribution of water is not the term static. It doesn't always stay in the same place. It's not always frozen in place. Heat, 
makes a big difference in how water evaporates. So that water uh, may evaporate and turn into clouds, which then drop precipitation. And then that precipitation may evaporate back up and precipitate again, clouds. Precipitation may be consumed by organisms. It may make its way into the groundwater by seeping through the soil. It may also be uh, remain in surface water, lakes, streams, those things. So this is kind of a graphic of the hydrologic cycle. Actually, this shows a lot of reservoirs. You notice that uh, a lot of uh, water is locked up in the ice. Uh, melting of this ice, this uh, 27,000, 27,500,000 square kilometers of ice and glaciers would be enough if it all melted to flood most coastal cities. The atmosphere has a fairly small amount of water, and only 13,000 cubic kilometers, that's square earlier, I meant cubic kilometers. The oceans are actually the largest reservoir, talk about reservoirs, of water. 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water. 8.2 million cubic kilometers of water in groundwater. A very small amount cycles through rivers every year. 40,000 cubic kilometers. So looking more closely at these reservoirs. Glaciers, 27.5 million cubic kilometers. The atmosphere, 13,000 cubic kilometers, the smallest of those say, uh, uh, reservoirs. Groundwater, 8.2 million cubic kilometers. We actually get our ground, our drinking water, uh, where we are here in Florida, central Florida, from the groundwater. Rivers. Now this is a discharge of rivers over the course of a year, 40,000 cubic kilometers. And the oceans, as I said earlier, they have the lion's share of the water, 1.35 billion cubic kilometers of water. So I talk about cubic kilometer. What is a cubic kilometer anyway? Who thinks in these terms? Well, let's, let's try to put it in terms we might be more familiar with. First of all, a kilometer, 0.6214 miles, uh, for those of us who are not yet up with the metric system, like no one around here. <laughs> uh, anyway, a cubic kilometer is 0.239 cubic miles. Oh, okay, here's a number. Here's, here's, you, you understand a gallon? A gallon? You know, it's a gallon of milk. 263,680,592,562 gallons of water in one cubic kilometer. That's a lot of water. So consider the ocean, volume of the ocean. 1.35 billion cubic kilometers of water. 3.5 times 10 to the 20th gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Again, these reservoirs, they're storage locations, storage locations. Now, consider turnover time, because there are some reservoirs that hold on to a substance for a very long period of time. We talked about carbon in a previous lecture. Carbon is locked up in limestone for uh, millions of years, same way with oil. In this case, there are areas that hold on to reservoirs that hold on to water much longer than others. So. The atmosphere probably has the shortest retention time. It takes only nine days. Nine days for, this is the turnover time, for all the water, water vapor, mostly, in the atmosphere to be replaced, to be renewed. Rivers, uh, the average is between 12 and 20 days. I think some rivers are long enough. It takes longer than that, but uh, it's a fairly short period of time. Lakes can be as short a residence time. Short a turnover time is 30 days. Some are as long as 50 years. I think 50 years is a short period of time for some lakes because some lakes are, are truly very deep. Um, but we'll go with that. 50 years. It's a pretty good range. The oceans. They turn over their water, change the water. It's renewed every 3,100 years. That's a pretty long time for something as dynamic as water. And the glaciers. I put a question mark here because some glaciers uh, have a fairly short renewal time, turnover time. But some glaciers can be in the multiple millions of years, two or three million years old. That ice has been locked up there for that long. A lot of interesting information in that. We'll talk about that in a later lecture. 
So let's look at the circulation of the ocean. We've seen this sort of a graph before. We're in the northern hemisphere, for example. We have a clockwise rotation of these currents. We have this uh, Gulf Stream current carrying that warm water all the way up there. We'll see how important that is. And in the southern hemisphere, we have this counterclockwise rotation. And those are the way those currents circulate, carrying some uh, uh, nutrients and actually they carry heat. And it's very important. We'll see that in distribution of uh, certain plant types, certain aquatic life zones uh, later in this lecture. This is another spinning disk. This happens to be the Pacific Ocean. I didn't talk about this earlier. This is actually Google Earth, Google Earth image. Uh, you can probably see that. Uh, it's my favorite uh, tool for making these, uh, these maps. You can probably pick out your favorite uh, uh, Pacific Island. Right now mine is Guam, about right there. So, what do we want to know, what do we know about the Pacific? First of all, it is the largest ocean basin, has a total area of nearly 180 million square kilometers. You notice that this disk I have here, North America, or America is someplace over here, and this is Asia, and all that area in between is ocean, huge. So, we could look for the Gulf of California, which is someplace over in here. We could look for the Gulf of Alaska, which is someplace up in here. Uh, the Bering Sea, way up here at the top, and that's also on the outside edge. Sea of Otusk, I think it's someplace in that area. Sea of Japan, about right there. Uh, China Sea, it's down here. And the Tasman Sea, and I think there's one more, the Coral Sea. It's somewhere down here. I'm not sure exactly where those others are, but most of that is just Pacific Ocean. The second, I guess, spinning disk we'll look at. This is uh, rotate Google Earth a little bit, and you come up with the Atlantic. Atlantic, the second largest basin, has a total area of over 106 million square kilometers, still pretty good size. If you look, we're more familiar with these basins. There's the Mediterranean. The Black Sea is actually over on this far edge. The North Sea, somewhere up in there. The Baltic Sea, a little further over than that. The Gulf of Mexico, probably the one we're most familiar with, the Gomex. And the Caribbean Sea, Mar Caribe. Yeah, that's, that's more closer to home, isn't it? Well, there's one more large ocean we're going to look at. There are, you know, you can divide that differently, but in this case, this spinning disk brings us out in the Indian Ocean, smallest basin, area of just under 75 million square kilometers. And right about there is Digar. That was the opening slide, was from Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So, for the Bay of Bengal, which is over here, east of the Indian subcontinent, Lakadive Sea, I had to look this one up, it's right to the south edge of uh, the uh, Indian subcontinent. The Arabian Sea is this basin up here. The Persian Gulf, I don't know why Apollo is in the top, I could have picked others, is right there. And the Red Sea is right in there. Kind of hard to tell those apart. I'm sure there's some names for these other seas down in here, but we, we stuck with those right there. So, this is a, a, a map, uh, or a, an image, it's in Google Earth. Um, this is an area, it says Challenger Deep, well it's a very deep spot in the ocean. The ocean has a lot of these things, but it has an average depth in the Pacific of 4,000 meters. That's a long way, very deep. That's average depth. The Atlantic is slightly shallower on average, 3,900 meters, and the Indian Ocean is the same, average depth. So, you're going to take a guess as to how deep Challenger Deep is, that the Pacific is an average depth of 4,000 meters? Well. This is one of many undersea trenches. This one happens to be uh, uh, one that's fairly well known. It's pretty famous. In the Marianas Trench, Challenger Deep is 10,902 meters below the surface of the ocean. That's almost 33,000 feet. It's a long way down there. So Challenger Deep, it would, if you were to put Mount Everest in this trench, it would still be two kilometers underwater. Two kilometers. Not nearly tall enough. 
Most people, I'm oh, sorry, most people, more people have walked on the moon a lot more than have been to the bottom of the Marianas. I see seen in here. It's very dark down there. I haven't seen a lot of the Marianas Trench. Three uh, intrepid explorers have actually been in diving bells to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and back. The longest mountain range in the world. More ocean facts. The Mid-Oceanic Ridge runs 40,000 miles. Very long way. None of the mountain ranges anywhere else on the Earth are nearly that long. The tallest mountain in the world. Well, you think, hey, of course, it's Mount Everest. Not so. In this case, it's Mauna Kea. We measure Everest from the bottom to the top. Well, Mauna Kea, which is on the big island of Hawaii, it is 10,000 meters above the seafloor from its base to its top. 10,000 meters. Now, not all of that, obviously most of that is below the seafloor, below the, uh, uh, the uh, below sea level, but that's how we're going to measure this mountain, at least I am. I didn't cheat. Look at the structure of this. This is amazing architecture that you can get in, these, uh, in the ocean where you have these beautiful uh, coral uh, fans, things that uh, attract so much uh, uh, biota, so much life. There's a littoral zone, a very shallow shoreline. We'll talk a bit about that. And these coral reefs are found just on the edge of that littoral zone. More on the Nerdic zone. It's from the coast to the margin of the continental shelf. Now I need to I'll put these in perspective when we look at the rest of the ocean, I think right now. So this is a graphic, uh, kind of a nice image. Here's the intertidal zone right here. The Nerdic zone comes out. And this is the rest of the ocean is all of this. So, the oceanic zone is beyond the continental shelf, beyond the nerdic zone. This epipelagic zone is a very surface, 0 to 200 meters. And the range things, there we go, I was bumping some. The mesopelagic zone, below that, 200 to 1,000 meters. Remember the average depth of even the shallowest ocean is 3,900 meters, so we're still well up in it. The bathypelagic zone, 1,000 to 4,000 meters. Most oceans are do have trenches that are, or all oceans have trenches that are deeper than 4,000 meters, so bathypelagic. Then there's this abyssal zone, goes down to 6,000 meters, and then the deepest spot that's area that uh, we looked at in Marianas Trench is called the Hadal Zone. Two characteristics of the Hadal Zone, very high salinity, very uh, high pressures, and uh, it's just a very, I guess, uh, difficult environment, but organisms still live there. The benthic zone stretches is anywhere there are organisms living all along the benthic zone. Habitat on the bottom of the ocean is considered benthic habitat. We'll use the same term benthic to talk about habitat on the bottom of lakes and habitat on the bottom of rivers and streams. Marine snow. You think, oh, of course it's cold, it's snowing. No, uh, not really. Marine snow is actually all the detritus, all the, the dead uh, organisms, all the, the waste, all the things that, uh, uh, all the, the fish and things that are swimming around up in here, um, plankton, whatever it is, when they die, they all end up coming down into these deep zones and they all provide nutrients that is where all the nutrients from these surface areas end up is in the deep zone they are very productive and we'll talk about upwellings later the nutrients from those upwellings actually come from these deep deep parts of the ocean that then this water gets forced up towards the surface and it feeds some very productive fisheries pelagic zones all this habitat, all habitat off the bottom of the ocean. So some physical conditions. This is a kind of a, an illustration of, well, light. In this case, light doesn't last very long. Approximately 80% of the solar energy, solar energy striking the ocean is absorbed in the first 10 meters. Right there in the very, even that's, that, that line is too thick to represent 10 meters. Most of the sun's energy is absorbed right there at the very top. 
very little goes past 600 meters. So it's pretty much dark below 600 meters. That leaves about 3,400 meters deep black water, the only light produced by bioluminescence. The only way to see in that deep black water is by bioluminescence or by having eyes the size of dinner plates like that squid we saw earlier. So look at some organisms that live in this deep environment. This is called the deep sea anglerfish. It has a little appendage that produces light. Uh, bacteria that live in this appendage actually are bioluminescent and they attract uh, organisms to the light. You can see that this looks like uh, that fish from, from Finding Nemo. You know, you couldn't make a cartoon. Uh, huge teeth, huge jaws, prey are attracted, they kind of get chomped on there. They don't have very much use for large fins or large rest of their bodies. Compared to other fish, skull system, all that is much reduced because there's not a need for it in these dark areas. This is actually the female fish because the male is reduced to a small appendage almost. Uh, uh, as a parasite stuck to the side of the female. Uh, darkness, low food availability, lots of pressure, very, very high pressure. So we try to bring these organisms, these two, we capture one uh, deep in, in the ocean and try to bring it to the surface. They, unless we pressurize that container, they will not survive because they can't handle the lack of pressure holding them together. Many, many times more pressure than we can handle. Right. Physical conditions again. This is a temperature graph. Uh, the surface is about 24 degrees C uh, down to 0 degrees C. You can see this surface water is fa fairly warm, 24 degrees C. Eh, it's about 74, 75 degrees, something like that. And then you get down, most of the ocean though is this uh, cold zone. 4 degrees C happens to be about 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So, temperature. Sunlight increases the velocity of water. Of course, that sunlight's only going to penetrate, most of it is going to be gone below that, that blue line there, below that, that 10 meters. So rapid motion of that heated water, the surface, decreases that water density, keeps it warm. Warm water floats on top of cool water. You do that. This zone of rapid temperature change is called a thermocline. Water goes through, uh, changes temperature rapidly with depth. And the surface layer tends to, to mix quite a bit. There's a lot of, of activity in terms of the wind-driven motion in this top. In this case, they're showing it's 500 meters deep. Uh, it may not be that deep, but at any rate. Creates this thermal stratification because that surface water is, is circulating. The deep water that is about 36 degrees Fahrenheit all the way to the bottom, you see that it's vastly cold. Um, that deep water is cut off from, it's isolated from that surface water. Looking at water movements, oceans are never still. Wind-driven surface currents across the open ocean create these things called gyres. Gyres, just kind of a big old, you saw it on the other map where I had the, the, uh, uh, the ocean circulations. They move to the right northern hemisphere, left in the southern hemisphere. I spoke of marine snow and the importance of that. These deep water currents cause this upwelling, bringing all that high nutrient deep water uh, up towards the surface. There is a steep uh, coastline, North and South America, that uh, basically forces those deep currents, forces that water towards the surface, and that feeds, provides nutrients to the algae, phytoplankton, that actually drives a very productive fishery off both the uh, west coast of North and South America. Salinity is a very important part of the ocean. They would take it for granted, I'm not sure, um, that the ocean is salty. But how salty is it? Uh, open ocean salinity varies from 34 parts per thousand to 36 and a half parts per thousand. That's not a very wide range, actually. The lowest salinity, and you can probably puzzle this out, occurs near the equator. Lots of rain. Precipitation exceeds evaporation near the equator. And then those higher levels of salinity occur in those subtropical areas where evaporation exceeds precipitation. We kind of saw some similar trends when we're talking about biomes. 
Salinity bands correspond to the latitudes of rainforests, between 10 degrees north and south of the equator, and deserts, 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Deserts are where the high salinity water is because it's drier there. Let's look at oxygen. Meter of air, we take this for granted because we breathe this. We're adapted to having a fairly oxygen-rich environment that we, we live in. It contains about 200 milliliters of oxygen at sea level. A liter of seawater contains at most 9 milliliters of oxygen. So, how do these fish get their, their oxygen, these organisms? They have to have very uh, uh, extensive uh, gill systems. We'll talk about this in a later chapter. Typically, the concentration of oxygen is highest near the ocean surface and decreases as you go further in depth. In the ocean, the minimum usually is reached about 1,000 meters and then it remains, remains pretty much steady all the way to the bottom. Look at the biology of the oceans. This is uh, an image of worms deep uh, associated with a deep sea hydrothermal vent. They do some interesting things. Most of the power, if you will, the sunlight that's fixed in the ocean comes from photosynthetic organisms. Photosynthetic organisms, uh, algae, phytoplankton, limited to that lighted zone, that lit zone, the epipelagic zone. So, phyto and zo, phyto meaning plant, zo meaning animal, plankton meaning free floating. So, a big part of the, the uh, base of the food chain in marine systems, lakes also, is phytoplankton being consumed by zooplankton. But when you get to the open ocean, particularly in this surface, this epipelagic zone, there's not a lot of nutrients getting into there and it's sort of not a lot of diversity. Uh, there's a biological desert. Uh, you don't, uh, it's hard to, uh, to find fish because there's just not that much life to support things out there. Due to its size, however, the oceans contribute a quarter, remember the oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface, oceans contribute one quarter of all the photosynthesis in the biosphere. Chemosynthesis, that's what's going on in this image. Chemosynthesis occurs near some undersea things called hot springs, hydrothermal vents on the bottom, and essentially what's happening is that these uh, bacteria have a symbiotic symbiotic relationship. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, yeah, symbiotic relationship. Bacteria have a symbiotic relationship with these worms, and the bacteria are able to take chemical, take sulfur out of the water, uh, and use it for energy. So they produce the sugars, and the worms are the one that the, uh, provide them with other nutrients. Uh, and that's quite an ecosystem growing down there. We do have tremendous influences on the ocean. For most of our history, however, the ocean was vast, still is vast, the ocean hasn't changed that much. Vastness has prevented us from really being able to impact it much, intrude much. We don't live on the bottom of the ocean, it's just too extreme for us. And we could be, we move to the moon sooner than we move to the bottom of the ocean. Less extreme. There are new human-induced threats, though, to the ocean. Over-harvesting, we consume vast quantities of fish, seaweed, and we're using tremendous amounts of minerals from the ocean. One of those minerals, and we'll talk about this in a later chapter, uh, is the oil we actually uh, drill and uh, kind of mining, but yeah, uh, oil drilling. And particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, this is uh, certainly an issue where we had the uh, largest oil spill in history. Uh, Deepwater Horizon was in the summer of 2010, and we'll have a little, little chat about that in a later chapter. Dumping. We have somewhat reduced in this country some of the dumping that goes on, but there's plenty, oh, plenty of evidence that we, for years, dumped tremendous amounts, just garbage, out in the open ocean. There's a thing called the Pacific Garbage Patch. There's one in the Atlantic, too. Caught in this uh, big uh, mid-Pacific uh, gyre, uh, where little bitty pieces of plastic are floating around, and it's still garbage. It's not like you go in the trash can and say, oh, there's garbage. No, this is, this is almost microscopic and microscopic stuff, but still, it's garbage. It's not something that organisms can eat. Supposedly, it's not twice the size of Texas. I think it has to be bigger than, than the size of Texas, but that's okay. 
the estimates of the size of the garbage patch, which is out there, based upon the analysis of these microplastic particles in the water. Micro, you know, basically, you take a water bottle, you break it down to little pieces, which is what happens in, in the ocean, and uh, that's what they're calling a part of this garbage patch. Well, it is garbage patch. It's something we put out there. Fish can't eat it, although they try to. Birds can't eat it, although they try to. Um, well, they eat it, but it doesn't give me any nutrients. It's basically, it's an impact that we have um, that we should uh, try to fix. Let's look at coral reefs. First of all, the Great Barrier Reef. There it is, seen from space. Coral is a mutualistic pairing, a matching of an animal, a coral polyp, and algae, an algal cell. Uh, the cell called zoanthaly, and that's actually a type of plant. The plant is the autotroph making the, the sugars, and the animal actually provides structure and provides other nutrients to the algae. It is a mutualistic relationship. Both these organisms benefit. This particular relationship, mutualistic relationship, forms the largest living structure on the earth. We use that shorthand, GBR, Great Barrier Reef. It's 1,600 miles long. It will stretch from Miami to Boston if it were off the east coast of the United States. It's a long way. It harbors, it's home to 30 species of whales, 1,500 species of fish, 17 species of dolphins. It's still being impacted, though. Now, what supports all of this life, all the whales, fish, dolphins, in this biological desert in terms of nutrients, relative low nutrient environment, coral. This mutualism is what does it. Now what is coral? What's the other thing about coral? I guess we'll get to that in another slide. I'll talk to that in a second. Um, follow this link to read more about the Great Barrier Reef in live science. Coral reef again. Reef categories in these shallow marine waters. These fringing reefs hug the shore of continents. The reefs around Florida, and there are quite a few off the east coast, obviously down the Keys are the most famous ones, but there are some also on the west coast. Barrier reefs stand between the open sea and the lagoon. The Great Barrier Reef protects the uh, eastern shoreline of Australia, the whole continent. And then there are these things called atolls. Coral inlets built up from submerged ocean islands. I showed you that picture earlier of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. It is a coral atoll. It's a kind of a circular uh, uh, lagoon, if you will. It's got uh, coral all the way around it, except for one little opening. Coral reefs are estimated to be home to half a million species. To put this in perspective, scientists have only identified, well, maybe about two million species total in the Earth on the Earth, on the, on the planet. Coral reefs only occupy 0.2% of the ocean floor. Very, very small amount. So the number of species, the biodiversity in here is just astounding. It's very, very important. Now, how else does coral, how does coral actually build up a reef or build any sort of structure? Well, coral deposits calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, limestone. Uh, the outside of the polyps, and that's the protective shell. Those coral reefs are built on this calcium carbonate base. That's really what it all is. Look at kelp bed. Something a little, a little different idea here. This is actually a uh, almost like a forest. Structurally, it's very similar to terrestrial forests. Almost picture that. As a canopy at the water surface, you can see all these fish grow in water up to 40 meters deep. That's pretty deep. Home to lots of species of fish. Other animals that live on the kelp leaves. Uh, even there are some mammals that uh, rely on kelp forests for their sustenance. Not not talking about fish. I'm talking about things like otters and things like that. Found in temperate waters, not too hot, not too cold, between 10 and 20 degrees centigrade, in every ocean. And one thing they don't tolerate is siltation. So you won't find them downstream from the mouths of rivers uh, at all. Uh, that's just one thing. So look at these shallow marine waters. So again, these are the locations of those coral reefs, primarily in these tropical zones. And then we have oh, 
Currents deliver oxygen and nutrients. I'll talk about uh, the uh, kelp forests here in just a second. Biologically, pro biological productivity depends upon how well these areas get flushed, removing nutrients or bringing nutrients in. So reefs and kelp beds among the most productive and diverse ecosystems. If you'll notice it, okay, I, showed, I cycled where the coral reefs are, but kelp beds, kelp forests are found way up here, all the way up Iceland, Greenland, uh, Scandinavia, same way, very far north. How is that possible that they could be growing that far north? Well, it has something to do with this Gulf Stream idea, carrying that warm water all the way up to Iceland and Greenland and those areas. So, they have a tremendous distribution all around the world. Marine shores, tides. The most important water movements affecting the distribution and abundance of intertidal organisms are these waves and tides. We're just going to take it for granted, it's something fun to play in, but these guys depend upon it. There are two types of tides we'll talk about, or mention, I'm not talking very much about them at all. Semi-diurnal tides, where you have two periods of low and high water daily. That's what we're familiar with here in Florida, because you have a low tide and a high tide pretty much twice a day. Then there's this idea of diurnal tides, where there's a single low tide and a single high tide each day. I know that uh, there's some places that have a single diurnal tide, where that tide changes uh, the, the uh, level of the water 50 feet. It'll go from uh, 50 feet higher to, to low over the course of a single day. The more marine shores. The inhabitants of the intertidal zone are adapted to an amphibious existence, meaning they can live and do live in both water and in uh, air. Different tolerances to how long. Periodicity is one of those uh, $64 words, meaning how long are they going to be exposed to air, how often and how long, and then the same is true for how long are they going to be exposed to water, the periodicity of that. There's a zonation of species depending upon their tolerance for these things. Due to the fact that we're getting more and more, <laughs> we are invading these uh, marine shores, these intertidal zones, there's a lot of exploitation of these areas. So a little bit on intertidal zonation. If you're looking at the area that's very seldom covered by high tide, that'd be the upper intertidal zone. Covered only during high tides is the middle intertidal zone. And uncovered during the lowest tides is this lower intertidal zone. So that all those zones are seen at least once a day, most ocean. And then covered even in the lowest tides is the subtidal zone. So there's some salt marshes, estuaries. This is actually a salt marsh. Drive up and down the east coast on I-95, uh, you'll drive past some really gorgeous salt marsh. And that's it's good to... Uh, I like looking at salt marsh. It's beautiful to look at. Um, I keep my windows rolled up because if the tide's out, it smells like sulfur. Estuaries, it's the definition of estuaries. And these are both salt marshes and mangrove forests fit in estuaries. There are where rivers meet the sea. You have a mixing of fresh water with salt water. Highly productive. Salt marshes, mangrove forests, concentrating along low-lying coasts. You won't find them on steep coastlines, but you will find them uh, all along the, the eastern coast of the United States, the Gulf Coast, uh, and uh, most, of, most of the coasts of the world have either salt marshes or mangrove forests. All of these systems are driven by the ocean tides and that combination with river flow you have a lot of rain, you're going to change the dynamics in these estuaries. They transport organisms, this flow, nutrients, oxygen, remove wastes, both the tides coming in and the water from the river flowing out. And the river flow is more likely to bring in nutrients and the ocean tides to carry away wastes and things like that. They are extremely vulnerable to human intrusion. Well, there's low-lying coastal areas, not very steep. We like to fish these areas too. And do other things there. Salt marshes and mangrove forests, how are they distributed around the world? You see that mangrove forests are mostly in these tropical areas. Salt marshes, well, they're found everywhere. Look at that, all the way up along the, uh, the, the, the Arctic Circle, uh, up uh, all the
all the way down to New Zealand. They are basically salt marshes found everywhere. It's very curious, I've found, that uh, um, salt marshes and mangrove forests are only, only co-occur right there uh, along the, the Gulf Coast, uh, the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico. That's interesting. Let's shift away from salt water. We kind of transitioned out of it when we started talking about estuaries. And talk about rivers and streams. All fresh water. Three-dimensional. Well, of course they are. They have the dimension of length, where they have pools, runs, riffles, and then rapids. Some of them. Although, you look at uh, the rivers in Florida, and you pretty much say pools and runs and um, no ripples and <laughs> definitely not any rapids. But there are, you have to admit that they're there. Width, the wetted active channel has a certain width to it, called a floodplain. And we'll talk about the Kissimmee River restoration and how that is changing the width, the effective width of the Kissimmee River. Vertical, you know, it's length, width, and up and down. So the water surface, and then there's a the water column. How deep is it? That is another dimension to rivers and streams. This whole idea of riparian zone, it's a transition area between the aquatic and the upland terrestrial environments. Uh, what I ask my face-to-face -face classes to do is to think of uh, the, uh, the building, uh, the health sciences building there at South Florida State College. Walk out the back door and you will be uh, uh, in cabbage palms and pine trees. And if you keep going, uh, in this case to the south, uh, you will walk through the riparian zone, which leads into Lake Glenada. Uh, lake Glenada being the lake that's right on the uh, right next to uh, South Florida State College. Well, dimension of stream structure. This is a prettier picture than I could have drawn. So you have this length idea of uh, the uh, river. And then width. Along this width, you have this floodplain area, and you have the active wetted channel. Uh, and then the depth comes into play over here, where you have water column, organisms live there. Organisms live, once again, a benthos, it's a benthic zone, same benthic zone that we saw. That's where organisms live on the bottom of a river. Then there's this idea of the high phoretic zone and the phoretic zone. Organisms live, this is where groundwater is coming into the river. High phoretic zone is the transition zone. This is the riparian area. You can see that the, the uh, tree is putting into roots into this uh, riparian area because it has continuous water supply that way. More on rivers and streams. They are vertically divided. The water surface, water column, and once again that benthic environment. The high phoretic zone is that transition area between the surface water and the groundwater. Phreatic zone is strictly that area that's in the groundwater, coming in from the sides into the stream. We see the same sort of phreatic zone in many of the lakes uh, around here that have sandy bottoms, but that's not where the water doesn't just stop at the sand, it continues into the groundwater, and that's the groundwater is the phreatic zone. High phoretic is that transition area. Stream order. Let's look at stream order. How big is a stream? First order streams are these headwater streams. So you have a couple of headwater streams. Which line represents a stream. Where those two first order streams come together forms a second order stream. And then where these two second order streams come together, you have a third order stream. You get the idea. Big rivers are very high in their order. Little streams not very. But physical conditions. This is kind of a graphic that shows there's a lot of organic matter being transported down this particular river. The organic matter in the flowing part, the upstream part of this river, is uh, more coarse, if you will, as it gets, uh, I guess, leaves and things like that that fall in that have to be shredded up by uh, mayflies and things like that, caddisflies. But as it moves downstream, this organic matter, which is what supplies a lot of the nutrients for downstream growth, uh, gets broken down into smaller into fine particular organic matter. And you can see that there's a whole gradient of fish that exist up and down this stream. Upstream fish require a lot of oxygen, a lot of fresh oxygenated water. That water's tumbling around. Uh, in the mid reaches doesn't require quite so much oxygen. And then all the way downstream, you have things like catfish that uh, really can live. Uh, in uh, waters that don't have as much oxygen in them, very much at all. 
So light is also an important factor, but in the upstream reaches of a river, particularly where there's a lot of shade, a lot of tree cover like this, uh, light is not as, it's important, but it's not as present. How much light shines on the surface of that river varies as you move downstream. The further downstream you go, the more light you're going to actually get shining on the surface because you have a broader and slower river. How far does that light penetrate the water column? Well, that depends upon how much suspended load there is, how much stuff there is in the water. Um, also, it's the same rule. The water is, has the same characteristics as seawater, so 80% of it is gone in the first 10 meters. Water movements. A lot more fast water movement. Water moves much faster in this upstream area than it does the downstream area. Often, these rivers will have a very large load of sediment that they carry with them. Uh, the Big Muddy, the Mississippi, has always been that color. It's been brown. It's not because of something we're doing. It's because it erodes most of the Great Plains and carries tremendous sediment loads. Also, once again, Big Muddy, Mississippi, continuously resuspends that bottom mud. It does not stay on the bottom. It just keeps rolling along. And then in terms of temperature, rivers and streams are a little different than uh, oceans. Temperature closely tracks the air temperature because it's so closely associated with the air. Rivers and streams. The chemical conditions in these areas. Salinity. You wouldn't think of salinity when you think of rivers and streams, but there are places where you can have uh, more salinity, more salt, in a flowing river. It depends upon what's in the basin of the watershed in terms of the soils. Color. Color is uh, something you wouldn't think of with rivers. We have rivers uh, in Florida that are considered blackwater rivers and up and down the uh, uh, coastal areas, particularly in the, the southern coastal areas of the United States because they receive a great deal of uh, tannins from the soils, from the muck soils. Uh, if, if a river basin, a uh, river watershed is primarily sandy or rock, you're not going to have a lot of color in it. But if it has a, uh, uh, flows through a substrate that can dissolve and add color, like uh, muck soils, then it is going to have a variety of colors. Oxygen. Oxygen is very, very important here. It's inversely correlated with temperature. So as the temperature, temperature of the water drops, it will hold more oxygen. Oxygen levels actually increase. And as the temperature rises, oxygen is, uh, the water won't hold as much oxygen. Usually it's not limiting in river systems because rivers are always flowing. They're exposing that, that water to the, uh, to the air. Human influence. We have a tremendous, we, we relied on rivers and streams for a very long time. Uh, we have shipped things on rivers for millennia. We have watered our crops with it for 10 millennia or more. And we've been disposing of our waste in rivers because, uh, well, that's just a lot easier, or used to be a lot easier. Uh, the adage uh, uh, in the, the uh, world of uh, wastewater treatment and wastewater permitting 50 years ago was uh, dilution is the solution to pollution, which is wrong because really you can't dilute it. It eventually settles out someplace. But the, the, uh, the theory, and it's still widely practiced in many parts of the world, is the amount of waste you can put into a stream depends upon how fast that stream is flowing, how fast that waste is being diluted. Mm. Let's look at the Kissimmee River, Kissimmee River Restoration. This is actually a, uh, uh, an image, a picture of the uh, Kissimmee River, Kissimmee River flowing in this direction. This is actually a restored section that I'm just drawing on right here. This is the old channel. Uh, it used to be a, uh, uh, well, it used to be, it used to be a natural river. And then, in the, starting in the, the late 1950s through early 1970s, uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers dug a, a, a canal, the C-38 canal, uh, basically put the Kissimmee River in that canal. And now, uh, we're restoring these bends. Kissimmee River watershed, uh, we are a part of that where we are in uh, Highlands County. And uh, this is an assignment that you'll get to look at later. Maybe look at it now. No, you could get to it already. So, lakes. You know, see all these lakes. There's lots of great lakes, big lakes, 
Lake Baikal, very, very deep lakes, like 5,000 meters. It's incredible, um, some of these lakes. The Caspian Sea is actually a lake, the Aral Sea, a lake. Um, but uh, you, one thing you'll notice there's not, where's Lake O? Lake O is not on this map. Well, that's because, yeah, most of the world's fresh water resides in a few large lakes, and Lake Okeechobee doesn't make the list. Great Lakes in North America, Superior, Michigan, yeah, those big dogs contain 20% of all the fresh water in the world. 20%. A very huge proportion, given that less than 1% of all of the fresh water and groundwater, um, of all the water in the world, less than 1% of it is fresh water in groundwater or, or lakes. Just like oceans, lakes do have a certain structure. They have this near shore area called the littoral zone. And then this open water area, which in oceans corresponds with the pelagic zone. We'll talk about that. Here in the littoral zone, of course, the sunlight is still penetrating that, uh, uh, that surface water there, and that big fish swimming along. Uh, so, looking at structure, shallow water, littoral zone, just like in oceans. The open zone, all of this is a limnetic zone. The surface limnetic zone is the epilimnion. It's a warm surface layer, a lot of algae growth there. The metalimnion, we saw a thermocline in the ocean. Well, you get the same sort of a thing here. Temperature changes rapidly with depth through the metalimnion. And then the hypo, or deep beneath, if you will, cold, relatively cold, dark water, definitely dark, because, once again, light goes away. And looking on the bottom here, we have this benthic zone, just like in the ocean, just like in rivers and streams. The bottom habitat zone is the benthic zone. The watersheds. This is a classic uh, diagram of a watershed. we got the mountains up here, the pretty little birds, and then the, the, uh, the river flowing through it, and all, these, uh, uh, all that water flowing downstream. Well, a watershed, by definition, put quotes around this. I'm using a marker, so I'm not going to do it, but Watershed is the area of land that drains to a receiving water body, a creek, a stream, a river, or a lake. Look for that definition coming soon to a test near you, maybe. Watersheds are very important to linking what's going on on the land, terrestrial characteristics. Uh, we talked last time about, generally, three types of soils in Florida watersheds, Florida land. Uh, that'd be sand, muck, and clay. So. Soil, soil type, vegetation, slope, all those things that are on the biome, on the land surface, with what's going on in the water, with those aquatic characteristics of nutrients, um, biota, how long that water is actually being retained in a stream or a lake. Let's look and see where South Florida State College is. First of all, this is the watershed. There's that Kissimmee River right there along the eastern side. It kind of runs ooh, right down there. And they're restoring parts of it there. So, South Florida State College is on the shore of beautiful Lake Lanada. Lake Lanada drains. There it is. Draining to Arbuckle Creek. Arbuckle Creek then drains to Lake Estapoga. Got a whole thing on Lake Estapoga. I could spend the whole day talking about Estapoga, but I won't right now. From Lake Estapoga, that water drains down to Lake O. Big Lake O. Yeah, we like it. Eventually, after it leaves Lake Okeechobee, it gets to the Atlantic Ocean, the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico, depending upon which way it is directed, uh, or the Everglades. A little bit makes the Everglades and out to Florida Bay, but not nearly enough. So the Everglades, St. Lucie Estuary on the east, Caloosahatchee, Caloosahatchee say that three times fast, Caloosahatchee Estuary uh, on the west coast that actually uh, flows uh, through uh, uh, Fort Myers, uh, St. Lucie Estuary actually flows into Stewart and uh, those, uh, those towns on the East Coast. So, Lake Istapoga. Hmm. Some residual marking. I'm not sure why that's on there, but we'll see what that highlights. This is the Istapoga watershed. Stretches from Crooked Lake in the north down to Lake Annie in the south. 600 square mile watershed includes well, I already said it. Crooked Lake down to Lake Annie, Highlands County. The lake surface at 
The median pool is 27,600 acres. It's a good number to remember. This is another good number to remember. The fifth largest lake in Florida. Fifth largest lake. It's larger, well, the only lakes that are larger than there are Lake Okeechobee, Lake George, Lake Apopka, and Lake Kissimmee. So, Vista Poga, number five. Straddles two counties. I'm going to highlight that. Yeah, of course it does. The lake, oh, this is cool. The lake, you think of 27,000 acres. It's going to be vast and deep. It dead gum shallow, 1.2 meters deep. Maximum 1.2 meters is less than four feet. Maximum depth, if you really stretch it, of not quite 12 feet, and that's in a very few places. The name of Ist name Istapoga is a uh, Native American name. Um, lakes that are shallow like that, particularly they're long like this, um, they can develop waves very, very quickly. The wind can whip up waves and the waves will get very high without warning. So what apparently happened uh, back in antiquity, and even not so much back in antiquity, um, the lake, uh, somebody would be out on the lake in a small boat and the waves would suddenly uh, whip up and dump the boat and that'd be the end of the person out on the boat. So, Istapoga literally means men have died here. Uh, you won't see too many of that on but those. Uh, that's not exactly a slogan for tourist development, is it? Very large littoral zone in Lake Istapoga. Right, this is an airboat trail right here and that is the littoral zone. You can just kind of see where it looks like a uh, uh, four-wheeler's been going up and down there, but that's actually where you run airboats. This whole vast area, all that is vegetation, and it's all wet. Then, immediately next to it is this open water limnetic zone. So you have the open water, here's the littoral zone right here, and then the limnetic zone, the open water zone. So physical conditions for lakes. Light you might expect that light has the same sort of limitations in lakes as it does in other systems. Lake color depends upon light absorption and biological activity. How much stuff is growing in the water will limit how deep that light penetrates. Temperature. Temperature has the same uh, influence at, in lakes as it does uh, in the ocean. Lakes can become thermally stratified as they warm, but they're small enough that sometimes the thermal stratification breaks down. Water movement. Wind-driven mixing, particularly of the surface water, that's kind of a, a mixing event. Doesn't look like it, but it is, trust me. Very ecologically important in terms of the algae growth in the lake. So let's look at some seasonal temperature changes. Uh, this is not a seasonal temperature change around here. We're calling this, I think I'm going to call this Wisconsin. This is from Wisconsin. Start out in the summertime. That surface temperature there is, uh, is pretty warm, well, for Wisconsin. Uh, 28 degrees C, that's pushing 80 degrees Fahrenheit. You can almost swim in that water. But you notice that down deep at the bottom of this little lake, it's still 4 degrees C. 4 degrees, about 36 degrees. It's a pretty deep lake, but it is Wisconsin too. As you go into the fall, into October, that surface water cools. Surface water cools to about 14 degrees C, which is you know, 50. 53, something like that. The bottom water is still the same, 4 degrees C, and as it continues to cool into November, all the water temperatures are the same, so the water, the lake circulates up and down, 4 degrees C, top to bottom. Then as you go further into winter time, you actually have ice on the top, 0 degrees C, if you will, frozen. Uh, the deep water is still, um, still 4 degrees C. Warms up into the, towards the spring, March, uh, once again, you have this cycling of water as that temperature all becomes, this, the water temperature becomes the same. There's no stratification, so it, it does circulate. And then in April, you start seeing this stratification redeveloping. Moral and chemical conditions. It's actually an idea of uh, how much nutrients are present in the lake. So, oxygen is important. In oligotrophic systems, there is a low amount of biological production, low algae levels, and well oxygenated. We'll just use that as a, a nice image of what a ligotrophic lake should look like. Eutrophic lake, on the other hand, you might guess that's the eutrophic lake. High biological production, high algae, 
for time, but uh, can be depleted of oxygen. Uh, so you have algae, algae blooms, algae blooms that can actually, when the algae die, uh, they uh, can actually cause a dramatic drop in the oxygen levels, and uh, bad things happen. Hey, I made it through this chapter. So have you. Hydrologic cycle. We talked about how water flows, how it uh, water vapor moves around the biosphere. The oceans and how vast they are. Average depth of the Pacific Ocean is 4,000 meters. It's a good little fact to remember. And also, the oceans make up 71% of the Earth's surface. They contain 98%. 97%, 7%, hold on a second. I gotta fix that. I got this wrong earlier, so I'm gonna get it right. Ah, don't do that. Come back. The wrong button. I'd go all day without doing that. There we go. Now then, 97%. Someone would have called me on that one for sure. 97% of the water uh, on the earth is in the ocean. It is salt water. I'm talking about shallow marine waters. That's where coral reefs are found. 0.2% contains 500,000 species. Marine shores, we talked about uh, kelp forests, those sorts of things. Estuaries, salt marshes, mangrove forests, it's where fresh water meets salt water. FW is my shorthand for fresh water. Rivers and streams, we talked about how they have length and width, the width of that floodplain, and depth. And we also talked about lakes. I can spend a lot of time talking about lakes. Mr. Pogo, fifth largest lake in the state of Florida. All right, a little note to leave you with. I don't know whether I made this in the assignment or not, but it's very interesting reading. This uh, is a research vessel, if you will, called Nerus. It's a hybrid remote op operated vehicle. Nerus, named after a mythical Greek god. Fishtail, man's torso. And this is actually what Nerus looks like. Nerus, the uh, vessel, if you will, remote operated vessel, that was used to explore Challenger Deep, uh, among other deep parts of the ocean. Read about it. It's interesting. These are the references. Environmental Science, Daniel Chiris, The Essentials of Ecology, Miller and Spoolman, Ecology Concepts and Applications, Manual C. Moles, and Elements of Ecology. Tom Smith and Robert Leo Smith. I leave you with a very pretty picture of some ocean with lots and lots of crashing waves.